pleasant evening. Thank you so much for joining us and welcome to the API, a program produced, presented and aired Tuesdays and Thursdays by the Agency for Public Information. We keep you up to date with all the latest developments in government policies and projects. On today's program, Prime Minister Dr. Ralph Gonzalez and other government officials were on hand on Tuesday to witness the recent arrival of EC $4.5 million worth of building and household supplies at Port Kingstown. The API recently toured the upgraded desalination plant in Beckway and will bring you an excerpt from that visit. And on this evening's IDC update, air traffic controllers at the E.T. Joshua Airport receive refresher training ahead of the commencement of operations at the Argyle International Airport. The details to these stories when we return. Here's Kisha Woodley with Newswatch. Good evening. Welcome to Newswatch. I am Kesha Woodley. Prime Minister Dr. The Honorable Ralph Gonzalez is in New York at the post-2015 summit and the 70th session of the United Nations General Assembly from today to 1st October 2015. Tomorrow, Prime Minister Gonzalez will address the post-2015 summit and later that day chair an international dialogue on ending poverty and hunger. Whilst in New York, Prime Minister Gonzales will host a town hall meeting at the Friends of Crown Heights on Saturday, September 26th. Across the world, World Pharmacist Day will be commemorated tomorrow under the theme, Pharmacists, Your Partner in Health. In light of this, the St. Vincent and the Grenadines Pharmaceutical Association and the St. Vincent and the Grenadines Pharmacy Council and the Ministry of Health wellness and the environment are focusing on the morning after pill. In this regard, the Ministry of Health, Wellness and the Environment and the Pan American Health Organization, PAHO, will conduct a series of medication use review in five communities across the island. The first review will be held in Georgetown tomorrow with the other reviews scheduled to be held in Mesopotamia on October 6, Chateaubelay on October 9, Kaliakwa on October 12, and Bekwe on October 16. Also in health, the Ministry of Health collaborated with the Pan American Health Organization, PAHO, to send a medical mission of five mass casualty management trained registered staff nurses to Dominica. Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Health, Wellness and the Environment, Louis Dichong, was among staff to welcome the nurses home. I am indeed very happy and I want to thank you once again and to wish you well as we continue on this journey of the delivery of healthcare. We are making every effort to improve the delivery of healthcare in this country. And there can be no doubt that healthcare is in a much better place today. And I want to thank all the different uh, areas of the health sector, different p uh, people who work in the health sector, the nurses, the doctors, because we know that the nurses run the hospital uh, each day, 24-7, that is. Team leader, Sister Elizabeth Medford, said she worked for two days in the casualty section whilst in Dominica. During that time, there was a family who lost a son, and we cried with that family. It was so touching. There was one other man on psychiatry who also lost a son and went into acute psychosis. There were nurses on the ward who we went to relieve because they had lost their homes. One of them has, had lost their husband, but she still showed up to work because that is how critical the staffing was at the hospital. Minister of State in the Prime Minister's office, Senator the Honorable Julian Francis, expressed gratitude to the nurses for going to Dominica. Ladies, welcome back and thanks, thanks for going to Dominica. Dominica flashback in our minds 2013 floods. 
And uh, when I saw Dominica, I saw 20 times, 30 times what we had in 2013. And I know that having lived through it and lived with it for well over three, four months until we had things rehabilitated and returned person's creature comforts to a reasonable extent following our floods. I could understand what Dominica has to go through. Meanwhile, on Monday, several representatives of organizations geared towards social development in St. Vincent and the Grenadines met at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs conference room. Representatives were there to learn more about the Australia Direct Aid Program. Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Nathaniel Williams, said that St. Vincent and the Grenadines and Australia have enjoyed healthy relations since the early 1980s. Australia, as far as we know, is one of the few countries of the world that have maintained economic growth for over 20, 23 consecutive years, economic growth. You know, the peaks and troughs within the global systems as such. And Australia, in their very modus operandi, has shown how countries of a stable nature, with a stable um, community, could show the rest of the world how countries can actually grow. Participants heard from Policy Research Officer Gwendolyn Roberts, who explained how the program can help them finance grassroots projects. Who can be an eligible partner for funding from the Australian government? We do do projects with individuals. However, those tend to be a bit more stringent in terms of our interactions and our vetting processes. Community groups are also eligible for funding, NGOs and civil society organs, not-for-profit organizations. And as of last year, we've started to work with local government organizations, such as the statutory bodies and various agencies that work alongside government. In education, nine finalists will compete to represent St. Vincent and the Grenadines in the courts and Ministry of Education annual reading competition. The finals will be held tomorrow at French's house beginning at 9 a.m. The finalists are Joella Cambo of the Spring Village Methodist School, Jadia Leah Chambers of the Barley Government School, Nadira Morgan of the Kingston Preparatory School, Caitlin Polius of Windsor Primary, Brianna David of the Canaan Government, Christy Olive of the Paget Farm Government, Azarez James of the Lauders Primary, Shaquan Sam of the Langley Park Government, Janos Lucas of the Kaliakoa Anglican, and Saskia Trusho of the Sugar Mill Academy. The winner of this segment will represent St. Vincent and the Grenadines in the regional finals slated for Dominica in October. Finally on Newswatch, Reverend Luz de Venezuela was the theme of an art exhibition hosted by the Embassy of the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela. This embassy joined 50 Venezuelan diplomatic missions around the world to simultaneously exhibit a sample of the work of Armando Reverón, the most important Venezuelan artist of the 20th century. This tribute is being held to celebrate the triumph of the remains, remains of this illustrious Venezuelan to the National Pantheon today, September the 18th. Thank you for viewing Newswatch. Good evening. I am Keisha Woodley. Comprehensive disaster management is about every one of us being ready to manage any natural or man-made event like earthquakes, tsunamis, fires, oil spills, volcanoes. It's about having your home or business prepared with an emergency plan and supplies. It's prevention, keeping your home, business or community well maintained and safe. It's about being able to get your life back on track after the event. Will you be ready? 
visit weready.org. Brought to you by Sadima and the European Union. A message from the National Emergency Management Organization, NEMO. If you've just joined us, you're viewing a presentation of the Agency for Public Information. In our featured presentation, the Government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines commenced the ordering of building materials from the Jamaica-based Tankwell Group of Companies in 2010, shortly after this country was impacted by Hurricane Thomas. Port Kingstown was a buzz of activity on Tuesday when another vessel arrived, this time around carrying 4.5 million EC dollars worth of building materials and other household supplies. The API was there and brings you more in this comprehensive report. The government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines on Tuesday, September 22, welcomed another shipment of building materials and household supplies at Port Kingstown. These supplies were ordered from the Tankwall Group of Companies in Jamaica, one of the largest manufacturers and traders in building materials in the region. The materials landed at Port Kingstown shortly after 1 p.m. on Tuesday and are valued at 4.5 million EC dollars. Prime Minister Dr. Raul Gonzalez was in hand at the port to receive these items along with other senior government and port officials. The Prime Minister pointed out that the materials received are not for the Housing and Land Development Corporation, but instead are for the Ministry of Housing to be used in the further implementation of their various major projects. This is not the first time that we have placed an order with Tankwell. The first time we did so was in 2010, um, immediately after Thomas. And they responded very, very swiftly. And they gave us good terms. The prices were good, competitive. I was so advised by the professionals. And we got good terms for payments over which we could pay. We didn't have to pay all the money one time. And subsequently, we have purchased from them. And whilst we have purchased from them, on every single occasion, we have also purchased from the local suppliers. We must always bear in mind when you're buying from the local suppliers that the only commodity in the building trade which we bring from Tankwell, which is produced here, they would bring in the raw material here naturally, but which is produced here would be the galvanized. Everything else, everybody has to import. This shipment of four and a half million dollars Eastern Caribbean, we get a year to pay. That means we pay monthly installments, 12 monthly installments. And what we have been doing is that when we make the payments in the past, we have made the payments from Petrocarib resources. It doesn't come immediately and directly from the consolidated fund. To buy, to get these materials to help people on credit for such a long period of time with good competitive prices is very generous. The local suppliers, some of them will give you a month, some will give you three months, some will give you four months credit and we still have outstanding credit and we can get more credit from Eastern Caribbean metals which is the which produces galvanized and also from bronze which produce which produces galvanized and from other suppliers we buy other materials too these materials are largely Lumber, cement, galvanized, plywood, some household features like the, the toilets, the kitchen sink, the kitchen sink and, 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 and so on. Because, you know, we provide 
and we're still providing for two important programs which we have devised. One is the program for the lives to live. The other is the program to assist in the rehabilitation after the natural disasters. And a lot of people who comfortably sit in their homes who are not involved in the management of this matter do not sufficiently appreciate the extent of the damage that people have suffered from Thomas come right up. And you have to be dealing with these on an ongoing basis. Nemo is important in assessing, but so too the Ministry of Housing. These materials are not for Housing and Land Development Corporation. These materials are for the Ministry of Housing. In other words, these are not materials to be used in the low-income housing project. I just want to say, in that regard, and I will speak a little bit more on that shortly, that there, I've mobilized the finances to address the Green Hill and Clay Valley housing projects for the Housing and Land Development Corporation. You know, Minister Daniel had answered a question in the House and had pointed out that additional resources were required and I have mobilized those additional resources. All the arrangements have been finalized. I'm talking the administrative arrangements. The, this particular Set, but set of materials again are going to be for lives to live and for some houses which we still have to deal with not just rebuilding of houses but to provide building materials for people who have some who have had some but the houses are not completely repaired on the spot where they have suffered da damage and then there are always people who are not as well off, poor people who cannot get all the assistance from the social development, the Ministry of Housing, through their professional staff will do an assessment and those who are to be assisted would get assisted. I know when people hear that there is 4.5 million dollars worth of materials. Everybody is bringing a list. And there are thousands of persons who are seeking to get materials. Clearly, materials which we have had before, materials which now come in, can't satisfy all those thousands because we have to address priority cases. Of course, there are some people who, with justification, would say, listen, my situation is as bad as Mary's, and Mary gets assistance. Why not me? Well, Mary's house might have gotten damaged in the storm or some other event, and there's Tom didn't, the house didn't get damaged. We will come around to Tom, but we got to deal with Mary first. And, and in this business, it has to be remembered, this is the only government since universal adult suffrage in 1951 that has ever been engaged in a kind of housing program and provision of materials, low income, middle income, no income through HLDC. Housing reconstruction after natural disasters, helping indigent people, delivering um, millions of dollars of materials. This is the first government. Prime Minister Dr. Ralph Gonzalez also said he was elated to be receiving the supplies. He outlined the areas of priority for which the materials will be used. In the case of the Clay Valley and Green Hill projects, a tremendous amount of work have been done, particularly at Clay Valley with, with certain 
corrections in relation to the the drainage system and, and, and how one or two of the houses were actually constructed and all the corrective work is 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 um underway. And they have some houses at Green Hill which they've delivered recently and they have some more to be delivered very shortly. And all the problems are being dealt with, all the challenges. And in all of this we must remember that we have built through HLDC about 1200 houses. We have through the Ministry of Housing itself, after storms and so on, did several hundreds more. And repair many. We have done 70 something units in relation to lives to live. Distributed again millions of dollars of materials. And then through our other policies, like 100% mortgage for public servants, like for instance, the distribution of lands. We have done about 4,500 lots, building lots, uh, since we have been in office. I've been touching up the numbers. And our housing program, since we have come in, that we have unleashed into value into the marketplace in excess of $450 million Eastern Caribbean is a significant amount of wealth which has been created. But more than that, more than the wealth in economic terms is a simple matter of improving housing for people and providing titles, providing water, providing electricity. I always hold the view that we have the education revolution, but to make sure that there's genuine equality of opportunity inside of the classes, all the children must have pipe bone water and electricity, and they must have reasonable accommodation, and they must have, as far as is practicable in all the circumstances, the internet service, and that's why we give all the laptops which we give. So there is a, is a whole bundle of things which go together to provide in practical terms the opportunities for people for their development and for advancement. I want to congratulate Montgomery Daniel and the Ministry of Housing. I want to congratulate Beresford Phillips for the work he has done in relation to housing and he's here helping with this exercise. Edwin Snag is the chairman of the Port Authority for all the work which he does here to help to coordinate and for all the workers and I want to express thanks to Tankwell who delivered to us. They're about a week or so late in terms of the original schedule they gave us. But they had said to me that they were finding difficulty getting the quantity of plywood and they had to try and source them somewhere else and so on and so forth. So they were in touch with us and telling us how they were moving. And this is something very joyous. This is not an election gimmick because we have been doing it in election season and out of election season. It's a policy. Because election is coming on, we must stop the policy. The policy must go and strike or go slow. Deserving people, poor people and others. You have to tell them, well here now, you see this policy of in housing? We stop in this policy in housing. We wait until the election is over because we don't want one or two internet crazies and the opposition to say, the government bribing people with, with, with materials. Have you any nonsense like that? You could bribe people with materials. That's what they think of people. And we don't distribute on the basis of political allegiances we distribute on the basis of need and the professionals are involved in it you see the professionals up there from the ministry of housing we have a policy we start from the premise that housing is a basic human right affordable housing of a minimum quality and standard and that is what 
we are providing. We have been doing that since 2001. Why must we stop it because the election coming on? Because Annie Muse has wanted to raise his, um, his voice on it. He said we, we're spending too much on the materials. I wish if the cash flow had allowed me to have nine million rather than four and a half million. But the cash flow, when I'm repaying over the 12 month period, doesn't allow me to do that because there are other things I have to use the money to do. So I have to look at it in a practical way while at the same time helping people and developing the country and adding to the, to the wealth and creating jobs at the same time. Today is a joyous day, a magnificent day. Meanwhile, Minister of Housing, the Honorable Montgomery Daniel, explained the role that his ministry will play in the distribution of the materials received. He noted that his ministry received numerous requests for materials and the demand for same is very high. I know it's not going to be an easy task. The demand for materials is very high and so I know that the ministry would be inundated with a lot of work. Believe you me, sometimes I would get calls 10, 11, 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock in the night that there are families who are trying to reach me, trying to seek building materials. And you know, in all honesty, I feel for persons like this. Because you can't tell me that somebody would want to call your home at after midnight seeking to have building materials and you do not respond. And so I'm happy that the government is meeting the needs of the poor, the needy. And so I'm indeed happy that I'm at, given the task at this time to help the poor and the needy and to make their lives much more comfortable and well. I know that I live in a constituency where the poverty level is one of the highest in the the country and the demand really for building materials in that constituency is indeed equally high and I want to do my best in terms of offering justice to that constituency. So from here on I know that um, the elections is in the air yes but it is a matter of the ministry been doing its work and doing its work across the board. We have assisted all and sundry, and so we intend to do that as we proceed from here. Also speaking, at Tuesday's arrival at Port Kingstown was Assessor in the Ministry of Housing, Mr. Beresford Phillips. Phillips noted that the Lives to Lives project is the area of greatest need for the ministry and will be given priority as it addresses the housing concerns of the elderly. Priority at this point is the life to live. That is the program we're definitely working on. Um, there's a great concern by this government for the elderly. And um, the, the government has uh, developed this program called the Lives to Lives, where we are trying to facilitate uh, persons uh, who are elderly and, um, of course, those who are suffering from some physical disability, which uh, uh, will somewhat um, affect their ability to uh, be able to carry out these repairs in their home. For the elderly, we are doing one-bedroom houses, uh, bathroom and toilets are also added to these uh, uh, houses, these homes, to make it easier uh, for persons to have access to these facilities indoors, as opposed to at the middle of the night you have to come outside to access these facilities. So for sure, um, I think the life to live is um, what will be given priority at this point in time, and um, this involves uh, benefits to the elderly. And Chairman of the St. Vincent and the Grenadines Port Authority, Edwin Snag, said the port is again working closely with the Minister of Housing in the offloading of the supplies. 
To this end, they have waived all the charges and have provided the necessary equipment for the offloading of the vessel in the interest of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. We have a, a time limit here because we operate within a period of 48 hours. That is the requirement here for this vessel to be here for 48 hours. Anything after that incurs a charge of 6,000 US dollars per day. So you realize what we're talking about. There is no, there's nothing cheap in shipping. Shipping is a million dollar industry. So everything that you, you see happening here has significant cost. Um, of course, the port would have waived all the charges that we will normally extend to other vessels and so on. Um, all, all our tonnage dues, etc., all port charges are waived. And in addition to that, the provision of equipment and what have you, all of that, you know, we, we had to provide. We also provided equipment for the, for the Ministry of Housing at both sites where they, where they were housing. We have our forklift operators and we also giving them the personnel also. Um, the port is responsible, of course, for the loading or floating of this vessel, both the longshoremen and we are also taking charge and responsibility for the stevedoring gang. In fact, um, we can use a ballpark figure um, and say it's probably costing the port in excess of $100,000 with relation to the waiving of fees and the costs incurred. But, but we have worked out with the Ministry of Housing a very efficient plan um, for this delivery. We are storing the containers here for them in the yard. We would store some of the lumber wherever is necessary because there's a term that we always use in this government, massa bull, massa cow. You know, so what's happening is that the port is actually propping the Ministry of Housing because we know that we're working in the interest of the poor and in the interest of the people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Reporting for the API, I am Dion John. Protecting our marine environment Our forests, our wildlife for our children Pollution of our rivers and beaches Deforestation and overfishing threaten to destroy our biodiversity Protected areas are set aside by law to protect these fragile ecosystems which provide us with water, food, electricity and recreation Tobago Keys Marine Park, Kingsill Forest Reserve and Milligan Key Wildlife Reserve are examples of our local protected areas Be inspired and help preserve what is naturally ours Let's Protected areas protect life. A message from the Environmental Management Department and the National Parks, Rivers and Beaches Authority. Welcome back. Residents of Bekwe now have a more reliable source of water. This is as a result of the efforts of the Ministry of Health, Wellness and the Environment in conjunction with the OECS RRACC initiative rallying the region to action on climate change. The upgraded facility features an increase in the water storage capacity from 20,000 to 60,000 gallons. The upgraded services allow for the provision of water to neighboring Grenadine Islands in times of need. The API recently toured the facility with officials from the Ministry of Health and has more in this report. We're on location in Bekwe. Actually, we are at Paget Farm and we are at the location where we have two projects. And Nasha Hamilton, um, our representative from the Ministry of Health in the Environmental Department, will talk to us a little bit more about what is situated here. As we can see, there are two major projects. There's a big tank here on my left, black, and a big white looking container, one here on my right. So she'll tell us a little bit about it. Under this RAC project that is being funded by the USAID and implemented by the OECS, we have now installed an additional 40,000 gallons of storage capacity. Which is on the, my left, bringing total storage capacity to 60,000 gallons. And we've also installed some distribution lines within the community of Paget Farm. Now, this project, the original intention was to provide 1,000 residents of Paget Farm with desalinated water. 
But obviously, Beckway is a small community. It has not only served Pratchett Farm community, I think it served the entirety of Beckway when times when they've not had enough rainfall for people to fill their cisterns, which is something that the people in Beckway do. When they're constructing their houses, they also, most of them, construct a cistern so that they collect rainfall. It has served the entire community of Beckway and it has also provided water for a couple of the other Grenadine Islands when they've not had enough water. Oh, so this means that this, is, this has um, expanded the capacity of the water intake um, for persons living on Beckway. Yes, this project is supposed to back up, provide a backup supply of water to the residents of Beckway so that when what they have runs out, they can depend on, on get some, some water from this system. Okay, and this is, um, who are the, the key players in this project? Well, I mean, the Ministry of Health obviously is the, the national coordinating agency working with the different stakeholders. We've worked between these two projects, we've worked with the Five Cs, the World Bank, USAID, uh, Mr. Herman Belmar, who is the Deputy Grenadines Director, there's actually a management committee on Beckway that deals with the, the management of the systems that is dealing with the distribution and, and maintenance and what's it not. And just to say that the, the, the plant, the desalination plant, I'm not sure if you know, but desalination is a very intensive, it requires a lot of electricity. So the project was supposed to make that carbon neutral. So what we did, in addition to putting in the diesel plant and the tank, was to install a solar voltaic system on the hangar of the Beckway Airport. So that system is supposed to provide the electricity to run the, um, the diesel plant. So the, the PV feeds into the grid from Vinlec, and then Vinlec supplies electricity to run the desalination plant. The, the PV system is a 75 kilowatt system. The, the plant requires 78,000 kilowatt hours per year for it to run, but the PV system itself supplies about 130,000 kilowatt hours per year. So obviously you know that there's an excess. So that excess amount of energy that is supplied to Vinic, they will buy it in a power purchase agreement and then that money is used to maintain for maintenance purposes of the rest of the, the systems. <music> All right, so we're here with Mr. Marvin Carr, and he's the contractor on the site here. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the work that you did here? Okay, well, first of all, it was very challenging to get this where it is today, this water tank. How we, so? We had to rebuild that whole public main road. Actually, it was not a road, it was really just a loaded truck. So we had to cut that, get it organized, put stone on top of it, get it to come up here. Then to bring up this tank here, this tank came on a 20-foot container in a country for continent, and we had to empty it pallet by pallet and brought it up by a four-ton truck. The excavation had to be done by hand because, you know, machines to fit in a small area was a very challenging thing to do. So more or less, it was very challenging, but at the state that we have, where the earthworks and the material, if you look on the side, you can see the type of material that came out was more or less stony, rocky material. So we had a lot of rock to break and what's not and things like that. Given all of that, now that the work is completed, mm -hmm. how do you feel about that and how do you see this benefiting the community of Beckway? Very proud. I, have the, I had the opportunity to build the first one. Okay. So I know that what it had achieved for the people of Beckway, especially not even in the community of Padge Farm, but the whole island of Beckway. Okay, and this one now would have expanded their capacity? Pa pa capacity by 40,000 gallons. Okay. So that's 20, this is 40, so they have a capacity of 60,000 gallons of water right now. That means they would be able to assist um, in times of disaster? Also. Exactly. Even to our neighbouring Grenadine Islands, that we, we could afford to send water down to our neighbouring Grenadine Islands. Okay, and how do, do you have any idea of how persons are in the community? To very happy, to very, very happy. They, they, you know, before that they had to depend on rainwater or they had to depend on water authority from St. Vincent to send on water via boats or some or jugs or whatever. Now they could just go down to the, the discharge station, they open the pipe and they know they get they fill up the drugs or who have tanks and things like that, they can fill from there. And this is free of cost to them? For right now, yeah. Do you think this would have um, made it more beneficial in terms of for the tourist um, industry? Exactly. What, what happened, even now that 
even the, all the tourism industry here, the small hotels, even the large hotels have an opportunity that they can come and purchase water at the dry season and what's not like that. All right, we are above um, rough ground for sure. Yeah. Um, a pretty elevated up mm -hmm. um, on a hill. Should there be um, any type of disaster, how safe would you say this site is in terms of tumbling down on persons who may be living or um, establishments that may be below? Very safe. We had to put in, for example, where Mr. Arnold was standing up there. You have a six feet high reinforced eight inch concrete wall with a foot in about four feet wide and a foot thick of concrete, double matting inside it. So we, we properly, we took care of all those aspects. We took those into consideration before we actually build it up. Mr. Arnold, it's day two and we're in Paget Farm Bakery. How are you feeling this morning? I'm good. I'm good this morning. Very happy to see um, the project is finally completed and um, to our specifications and I can. And I'm happy to know that um, it has been in use um, for a while. Um, it is off right now because they're just doing some maintenance work on it. But then from all indications, um, the project is a, su a success. Can you explain a little bit more to us why this um, location was chosen specifically so high up for for this site? Okay, um, the, the location was chosen ba basically for a gravity flow system type of system. Because what happens is that all of the water that's produced at the desalination plant at the coastline is pumped up to this um, elevated tank. And then from here it is um, distributed via gravity. And what we're looking at doing is that there will be a further expansion of, of the network, the water network from this tank. So you find that persons who are living at this elevation or slightly lower will be able to get their water by gravity without having to pump. Because if, it, if, you, if you were to put it at a lower elevation, it now means that you'll be pumping the water back uphill. So what you're saying, there's more expansion plans? Yes, yes, there is, there is um, the, 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 the future expansion um, plan that for, on the distribution um, water network. So this tank is coming in very handy to persons of, of um, Beckway. And like Mr. Carr indicated, um, it, is, it is serving a dual purpose because it is one, it is building resilience against climate change because as you can see, when there's a drought period, there's very little rainfall. And since the majority of persons in Beckway really relied on rainwater harvesting, which has been there from time immemorial, what you find happening is that with the reduction in rainfall, persons are not able to, to, to have as the amount of rainwater they would like to keep them going for the entire year. So with this tank, we've now built in a, a resilience factor into the whole question of the water supply because seawater is in abundance. So if we can desalinate it, we can have um, a supply of water to be able to, to, to get to everybody year round. So that's, that's the, 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 um, the, the whole thrust of this project. About it, so give me a little bit more background or history about the tank, where it was, where it's coming from, okay. its capacity, etc. Sure. Well, the, the, the tank is a glass fused steel tank. So basically what you find happening is that it's a steel tank, but it's um, actually um, glass is fused to, to the outer and inner panels of, of, the, of the tank. So you find it, it resists corrosion in that way from salt blasts and things of that nature. These tanks normally have a lifespan of about 50 years. So without the, the, the glass being chipped away at, these tanks can, can withstand the harsh environments in which they, they, they're made to operate, which is in um, essentially um, salt water environments. The tank is also designed for 150 mile per hour winds in terms of hurricanes. So if a hurricane is um, approaching the island, all, all that has to be ensured is the tank is filled with water. And with that, it will be able to withstand up to 150 miles an hour. It is also designed for um, seismic activities uh, for the, the, the zones that in which we operate. Plus the foundation is able to withstand the, the column of water that, 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 um, that's within it. So the overall, the design is pretty safe. And also, you, you asked a while ago, well, if this tank was to, to, to collapse, what will happen? These tanks are designed in such a way that when they collapse, they don't collapse as a, a whole. It will more or less crumble on its own if it's empty, and then it will be able to, to, to um, avoid the, the cat catastrophe that can, can um, emanate from these kinds of things. We, we looked at all possible disasters that can happen at a site like this, and one of the biggest concerns we had was one of runoff. Because we're on a hillside, you'll get um, overland flow or surface um, flow. And if you look around, you'll realize that the entire place is well drained so that there is no percolation through the soil that can lead to soil creep or anything of that sort. So any water that comes into the site is controlled into, to, in, into um, properly lined drains, 
and uh, taken away from the site and discharged to, to, to the ocean. In a way that does not affect, affect residents anyone. or bi our business. Yeah. In discussions earlier on with the contractor, um, during the recent um, rains they had over the last two weeks, um, he came up here and the, the site will pr um, function properly. There was no runoff that was affecting any of the houses and things of that sort. And even when they were doing some maintenance on the tank and they had to flush it out, all of the, 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 um, the overflow from the tank is um, taken away from the site through properly concrete line drains and that has worked well. Okay. All right, so we have discussed all the technical aspects of things and the location and stuff and we see that everything is working smoothly and the OECS and RAC, they're happy for the work that they, they're happy that they could have contributed to something that is working and mm -hmm. that is benefiting the community. Encouragement to persons watching in terms of taking care of their bodies and their environment. Well, the thing is, water is life, so you have to, to cherish water and given the fact that climate change is going to be affecting water globally, we have to be more careful of how we deal with water. We have to think of how we, we, we treat the environment. We also have to, 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 to look at um, being more conservative in our practices and whatnot. Because one of the, 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 the slogan we have for this project is to rally the region or to rally persons to rethink the way that they they do things, it's not um, business as usual, and to respond to the whole question of climate change and going forward. Because like I indicated, with the increases in, in, in global temperatures, we're going to have a lot more um, frequent droughts or longer drought periods. We're going to have more intense rainfall events that can lead to flash flooding, landslides and things of that sort like we saw in Dominica. So we must be able to rally, rethink and respond to the, to the impacts of climate change. Thank you so much. You're most welcome. Our final presentation is an IDC update. Three batches of air traffic controllers from St. Vincent and the Grenadines embarked on a refresher course on Monday, September 21, in preparation for the start of the operations of the Argyle International Airport. The workshop is taking place at the training room of the Argyle International Airport and was addressed by officials from the E.T. Joshua Airport the IDC and the Trinidad and Tobago Civil Aviation Training Center. Here is more from the IDC's communications officer, Jennifer Richardson. Speaking at the opening of the refresher course being undertaken by the government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Senior Airport Officer Dillett Davis noted that the course is being done at a most opportune time as the government prepares for the operation of the Argyle International Airport. It constitutes part of a series of training programs for air traffic control officers that have been sponsored by the IADC. There are currently five IADC sponsored personnel at the Civil Aviation Training Center participating in the Aerodrome and Approach Diploma Training Program for boarding air traffic control officers. There will also be training for several senior air traffic controllers in the areas of supervisory training on the job training methods and practicals in air traffic control service, which will be held at the Civil Aviation Training Center in Trinidad, running from the 13th to the 29th of October 2015. This training course will serve to refresh participants on the standards recommended practices and local procedures pertaining to the three basic functions of air traffic service, namely air traffic control service, flight information service, and alerting service. It will focus on key areas such as separation minimas and emergency procedures and safety management systems. In his remarks at the opening ceremony, Chief Instructor at the Trinidad and Tobago Civil Aviation Training Center, Carrie Price, said they are happy to have been chosen to provide this training to the air traffic controllers of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. I would like to 
echo the, the words of Dillette um, and to encourage you all to participate as much on the, on the training program because it is as much um, training as it is a discussion and a, a venting of ideas with regards to the way forward in terms of the operations at, at Argyle. Um, I would like to say personally that I think all of you here should be very proud of yourselves for the project that you all um, have undertaken here. While we do have some large projects in Trinidad from time to time, I, don't, I can't remember at any point in time us undertaking a project of this magnitude in terms of the amount of civil engineering works, in terms of blasting, um, rerouting of the river, putting on an airport in the middle of a valley. I think the government of Trump, St. Vincent and St. Vincent as a, as a country should be very proud of this project. So that... <laughs> So that while I would like to echo what, what Dillette said in terms of you all taking full advantage of this training program and ensuring that it, is, it redounds to the benefit of the International Airport Development Company and the Department of Airport of the Government in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, I would like to give you one word of caution, which is a word of caution that I always give in any training program that, that we deliver, which is that the real success of this program will not be measured or could not be, cannot be measured over the next few weeks. The real success of this program will only be measured when you will actually go into the operations. Chief Executive Officer of the International Airport Development Company, Dr. Rudy Matthias, noted that among the several things that are to be done to get the airport ready for operation, the refresher training course is only one of them. I consider today, though, an important part of the whole process of getting ourselves ready for operations before the end of this year. This is part of the management system for the operation of Argyle International. It's a critical part of it. Over the years, we have been working with the airports department, Carl Robertson, the present director, is a member of our board of directors. And uh, she and uh, her deputy, Mrs. Best, they have been assisting us in many significant ways since we started construction of this airport up to this day. I believe that the approach that we have taken at Argyle is to incorporate all stakeholders. All important stakeholders have been incorporated in the process over the years so that we have a harmony that we've built since 2005. Everyone who ought to be involved have been involved. And the airports department has been involved and has played a significant role over the years. After all, this is your airport. What we are building here at Argyle is a modern facility for all of us. But you who are going to be working here you are going to be enjoying it, I suspect, a little bit more than most of us. You are going to be in a new, and if I may say the word spanking facility, and believe it or not, very soon too. You know that we've built the terminal, the control tower, sorry, and uh, we are asking the Canadian company Aeronav to come back sometime in, by mid-October, to put in the computers and the other equipment, including the communication software. So that after you finish this refresher training course, you can feel free to come into your control tower cabin and start familiarizing yourselves with what is there. Dr. Matthias also gave a brief update on the installation of equipment and other works currently taking place at the Argyle International Airport. As you look around, I'm sure you would see that many things are happening. The terminal building, this terminal building has been retrofitted right now. And uh, most of the equipment that we need in it are already here. Uh, the desks, checking desks and counters and so on for airlines and customs and immigration, they are in containers here and in, um, on the port. We also received recently some of the um, furniture, the public furniture, they are here also. And uh, hopefully by the mid-October, 
you should see the terminal building essentially equipped with the equipment that we need to have the terminal building ready for operation. The airfield works are ongoing and uh, this week we are going to start the second course on the runway. The runway asphalt work has been done in two layers. The first uh, coat is an eight centimeter asphalt layer that we have done, perhaps we've done about 80% of that already. And uh, this week we are going to start putting on the second course which is five centimeters on the area where we have already laid the first course. We are going to work as hard as we possibly can to have these works done no later than mid-November. No later. But while we do that, of course, we are also doing other things so that we are working simultaneously on several things, several small projects. Director of Airports in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Corsell Robertson, having given a synopsis of the development of air traffic control in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, said the start of the refresher training program marks the beginning of further development in the area of air traffic management as preparations begin for the start of operations of the Argyle International Airport. This project is a major project for this country. As mentioned before me by Dr. Rudy Matthias, and by Mr. Carroll Price, it was a tremendous undertaking. The option of having to build an airport within a valley, cross a river, and remove mountains, literally remove mountains, was a difficult task. But with determination and resilience, we are seeing that it is coming to a successful completion. This airport is expected to open the gateway for improved air access to this country and to create myriads of opportunities for our economic growth and development. Its 9,000 feet long runway will allow air traffic control, as I'm sure, to rest a little easier when large aircraft are taking off and landing. I believe that each of you here may recall a moment when an aircraft taking off at the E.T. Joshua Airport caused you to hold your breath as you imagine it trimming the grass at the end of the runway as it lifted off. But soon we would no longer be facing that situation and I'm sure you're all looking forward to it eagerly as I am. This project has a critical element that would continue far beyond the completion of the airport's physical facilities. It is the same operation of aircraft. The decision of each pilot in an aircraft affects that aircraft and maybe one other. The decisions of an air traffic controller affects all aircraft operating. To each air traffic controller who continues to work out of sight of the general public but without whose service, our air transport comes to a halt. Into your hands is placed the responsibility of maintaining safety and efficiency in the control of air traffic. You must remain focused, committed, and determined to deliver top quality service on every shift each day. You are a capable and talented group. Never drop your guard. I would like to acknowledge the role of the Trinidad and Tobago Civil Aviation Authority and the training center in particular in putting together the training program. Especially Mr. Carrie Price, who is here with us today, and Mr. Ricardo Henry, with whom I first established contact. They have been most helpful and supportive during this process. Mr. Price and his team have tailor this program to meet your needs. The support and assistance provided by him was critical in the design of the program and for that we are grateful. For more information regarding the construction of the Argyle International Airport, you can log on to our website at www.svgiadc.com or find us on Facebook at Friends of the Argyle International Airport. This has been another presentation of the Agency for Public Information. You can join us again on Saturday afternoon at 5 for Inside Story. 
On behalf of the entire production team, I'm Dion John wishing you a pleasant evening and a wonderful weekend.